definitely motivates me to learn. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of those who are joining us live across the world and to those listening in afterwards. Welcome to the 17th episode of FIP's Digital Program on the Development Goals, Setting Goals for the Decade Ahead. Today's episode is about competency development, the FIP Development Goal 5. So let me first introduce myself. I'm Libby McCourt or Elizabeth, if you would like to be a bit more formal. I'm a health professional research coordinator in lovely Queensland, Australia, and I'm also a consultant with Disaster Pharmacy Solutions. I'm also joined today by the fantastic Marwan Eckel, who's the FIP project manager for Workforce in FIP. Um, so just some quick announcements before we start. We'd like to share a bit of housekeeping with you just to make sure that we're all on the same page throughout the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and um, is being live streamed via YouTube. The recording is going to be available on our website, www.fip.org, um, if you would like to gain access to that later on. You can ask questions using the um, Q&A box below. And if you'd like to sort of do a bit more of a general chat and introduction, please feel free to use the chat box but if you could keep your questions that we can direct to the panelists at the end to the Q&A section that would be fantastic. You're also welcome to provide feedback to the webinars um, using the email provided there webinars at fip.org and of course if you're not already I would really encourage you to become a member of FIP um, by clicking on that link there. But for now, I'm going to hand over to um, our co-moderator, Marwan, who's going to be discussing the next section and introducing our first speaker. Thank you, Marwan. Thank you, Libby, for the introduction and thank you for moderating this webinar with FIP. So um, uh, just um, as Libby said, this is uh, a webinar from the series of the development goal webinars. Uh, the theme is setting the goals for the decade ahead. So next slide, please, Libby. So setting goals for the decade ahead is a comprehensive online event series which provides coverages of the 21 goals over 21 events in 2021. Outcome of the 21 digital event is to mobilize global pharmacy development and transformation through development goal. By engaging our profession, members, and colleagues everywhere, we aim to provide a description, direction, and context for each specific goal. And we will be monitoring and evaluating through data evidence and identifying priorities across practice, science, and workforce and education. We will be going over these three elements on our webinar today. Just to note that we have received a lot of feedback about developing the competency development across the globe. And we are very happy to deliver this webinar with our esteemed speakers. Next slide, please. So till now we have delivered mostly, uh, this is the 17th, one of the 21. So we started in March and the webinars will continue till December, 2021. Today, we are doing the competency develop, development, the second, October, the second one in October, and we will be having four more webinars to come till the end of the year. Please register for the upcoming webinars if you are interested in them, quality assurance, antimicrobial stewardship, and we will be having medicines expertise and impact and outcome uh, by going to events.fip.org. Next slide, please. So today is competency development, DG5, and we'll be describing the goals and explain the components of DG5, workforce education, science, and practice. We will showcase the FIP tools, evidence, and resources to support DG5 implementation across the state elements. And also we will be launching in the practice session, the humanitarian framework. I will leave the, uh, uh, the floor later on to our moderator, to our speakers uh, about the practice uh, element. Uh, identifying priorities across practice, science, and workforce and education within DG5 and engage our member in an activity to support monitoring and evaluation of the goals through data evidence. Next slide, please. 
Today, we are very delighted to have uh, a, a group of speakers that are highly engaged in competency development. We will be having Ariana Mestrovic, we will be having Sidi Vangrenu, Andrea Bruneton, and Naoko Arakova, who will be uh, going through the different elements of the DG5 competency development. We will be having a small bio for each of the uh, speakers uh, before their presentations. Next slide, please. So one FIP goals, we can have no pharmaceutical care without a pharmaceutical workforce, and we can have no pharmaceutical care without a scientific foundation for the next decade. That's why it's always important to think about the three elements, workforce and education, practice and science, in order to deliver the care that we want and the services that we want to our patients. Next slide, please. So, as we said, we have 21 goals, and in the next slide, we will be uh, having a small video about the goals. the goals, please uh, follow the uh, social media pages and visit the FIP website in order to have a better uh, view about the 21 development goals. So as we said today, our fifth development goal that we'll be discussing is competency development. Next slide, please. The, each goal has three elements, the workforce and education, the practice element, and the science element. And our speakers today will We'll be talking about the three different elements. We'll be having Ariana talking about the workforce and education element. Uh, Sylvain and Andrea will be developing and uh, speaking about the practice element and launching the humanitarian framework for pharmacists. And uh, Naoko will be uh, presenting the size element of FIP development for five competency development. Next slide, please. So uh, I am uh, delighted to uh, start by presenting our speakers. We will start first by Ariana Mestrovic from uh, Croatia. Ariana is an assistant professor and independent consultant in Pharmacy Expert International Agency, vice president of academic pharmacy section and member of board of pharmacy practice and lead for competency development in FIP. Ariana is a member of the International Service Program Advisory Group uh, for the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education. Also, Mariana, uh, Ariana is Pharmaceutical Care Network of Europe and internationally consulted for WHO and co-chair of Smart Pharmacist Program. Ariana is dedicated to promote competency-based education and CPD cycle among pharmacy practitioners. 
Ariana, thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marvan. Thank you, everyone. And dear colleagues, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it is a very important topic. Competency is something that once you start to talk about it, nothing is the same anymore. Because competency is much more than knowledge. It's much more than the job description. It's much more than uh, the level that you want or I want to achieve. It is something that it's very complex in its, um, um, uh, uh, in its uh, es essence because uh, it compiles knowledge, experience, uh, some skills, but also attitudes and values. According to the FIP development goal number five, uh, I, I'm delighted to talk about the aspect of the workforce development and education. And um, it would be very hard to even talk about competences and not to talk about education, because education will be now very soon seen as a super powerful tool to increase, to develop the competences. But we will see very quickly that, that education as an activity is not enough. This is just the start of the development, but also we need uh, evaluation, we need uh, reflection, we need to see where we are at the moment, so to be able to achieve the goals that are maybe we are putting for our own selves, or maybe our organization is putting it for us, or maybe the employer is putting it for us, or maybe we want to achieve the certain level that the certain level of competency is desired to be developed. So with competency development, we are using, um, as you can see here, evidence-based tools, uh, which are produced uh, through FIP uh, uh, different groups for, for many, many years now. It will soon be 10 years since we launch, launched the first version of the Global Competency Framework. And uh, many of us practitioners around the world were using the Competency Framework of FIP, not just to improve our practice and our own competences, but also to do some research and to improve our educational activities. Please, next slide. So yeah, I'm also very happy to introduce uh, to you all the leads from this uh, competency development goal. Uh, we are all um, uh, having the same interest and we have all uh, completed our PhDs on this topic. So those are Andrea Bruno Tome from Portugal, Naoko Arakawa from Japan living in UK and myself from Croatia. So we are all kind of the same generation of falling in love deeply with competency frameworks. And uh, I'm super uh, pleased and very proud that I can be a part of this very important trio in, in FIP. Next slide, please. So yeah, uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with uh, some of those uh, titled pages. Uh, FIP Educational Initiatives uh, or FIP Ed has been going through that journey with many, many individuals, volunteers, experts who were trying to put together what the pharmacist of today should know should do and should be. Because as we said, do is for knowledge. Um, actually, uh, no is for knowledge, do is for skills, but also being is for attitudes and values. And um, I'm sure that all of us are very curious to see how we compare our competences to the global standard of the, for example, community pharmacist uh, anywhere in the world. And uh, the first one that you are seeing on the left-hand side is a, um, is a global competence framework which was uh, uh, developed and published in 2012 very important document with many countries as you can see on the uh, here on the screen contributed to the validation of the of the of the framework and since then uh, as i already said many many publications many research many educational activities but also many personal development goals have been developed all around the world thanks to this document. And then uh, in 2020, we have published uh, also in FIP the version two of this document, which includes more modern um, uh, competences such as emergency response, such as vaccination, such as working in collaborative teams in the special uh, pandemic issues like we are just facing now. And also it's still developing, it will be 
coming with the new instructions and with the new paragraphs so anyone can use it. But also we have FIP Global Advanced Development Framework, which was uh, version zero was introduced in Abu Dhabi. Here you can see version one from 2020. All of these documents are available on FIP website. So if you want to take a look, it is something that you should be really inspired with. And the Global Advanced uh, Development Framework, I will talk about it in a minute uh, in a little bit more details. Please, next slide. So uh, when we talk about competences after educational activity for the workforce development, is it outcome or is it more than that? So what I really like to emphasize, the competency is the ability of the student or the healthcare pr practitioner to use and engage all the resources of their knowledge, skills, attitudes and values to perform on desired level professionally. So as you can see, the willing aspect in the competency uh, uh, area is something that we should really press the button on, not only in educational activities, because we need to deliver some motivation, but also in our everyday practice. And competency-based education, therefore, must address not only knowledge and skills, but also that motivational part. And we always remember those speakers who have touched our hearts a little bit. So we have a desire after that lecture to change something in our performance. Once we change our performance, we can say that we have developed in the competency area a little bit more than before. Next slide, please. So is it really our choice? Is it really about when I wake up in the morning and go to my pharmacy? Is it really about deciding how am I going to perform today? A little bit, yes, because sometimes when we see an important patient or maybe it's a it's a someone that your boss is calling, you, you know, some doctor will come and then he will ask you some things in the pharmacy. Then we combine the knowledge and the skills and attitudes and values in a little bit more comprehensive, stronger way. You know what I mean? So we shine a little bit. Um, more than maybe in our everyday practice. So it is the engagement element in the competency performance as well. Therefore, it's very important to say, you know, we are making choices from repertoire of behaviors, how we are actually going to combine what we know, what we do, and what we should be when we meet the concrete patient with the concrete need, and when we are actually facing the challenge, how competent we are. Next one, please. So <clears throat> I will also show you the few uh, background um, theories uh, or models that have been developed in FIP all over the years. One of those is FIP needs-based education model, that it's extremely important once we organize the educational activities, not to do it from scratch or how do we feel this morning or what would we like to teach, we will need first to take a look at the needs of the community that we are living in and operating in. Uh, these days, you can see on the photos what the new needs for the pharmacist skills and knowledge should be to deliver vaccination, to be a place for a triage, to ask important questions to the patients, also to dealing with post-COVID symptoms, because in the healthcare systems, this is a big need for that. So what is the need in your country regarding to the actual situation? What kind of services would you like then to deliver to the patients? You can see some of those services on the pictures, but I'm sure you can imagine many, many more. And then there is a question, what competences do you need to have to deliver those services? Because if it is vaccination, within, we need new skills, maybe even new attitudes and values than we used to have before. So the education, which comes at the kind of end of this first cycle, will be designed according to the needs and services that we want to provide, but most importantly, to address the level of competences that we are having now in this group of students or practitioners, and then uh, the, the desired level of competences that we want to achieve. So we are starting from the needs, we are designing or creating or imagining the services that we want to deliver, then we should say, are we capable to do so? Or if not, what kind of education do we need to develop skills? attitudes, values, and knowledge, of course. Next one, please. 
In this one, we can also see the very famous CPD cycle, so-called infinity cycle, because we know that the um, continuing professional development is much more than just continuing education. It starts with, with reflection, and reflection includes already where am I today? What kind of competences am I having today? So what is my plan? Do I want to deliver vaccination service, for example? Okay, I need to learn something. And then it is the first time that I will evaluate my competences. Can you just press the button? I need some animation here, please. So the first arrow, thank you very much, you will see, you will evaluate your competences after the course. And then you say, okay, I think I'm ready for vaccination. Then you can see the arrows are moving uh, more to the application part. And when the application part is finished, when we are back to evaluation, what do we expect? Once we learned, it was, for example, the new level of competences. But then once we apply, of course, this level of competences should be higher. And those are two two moments in the CPD cycle that we should take a look at the competency list, maybe self-evaluation or peer evaluation or our boss evaluation should be there, but we need to measure how well we know, how well we do, how well we are in this thing after education, but especially after application. Why? Because the reflection in the next CPD cycle will now be different. Our plan will be different and our learning will then build on the competences already developed. Next one, please. <clears throat> Here you can see that competences can be measured and evaluated, but also compared. This is the result of actually um, uh, my PhD work, which was done 10 years ago and published. So the, it's possible to have a group of, for example, pharmacists. Uh, this was a group of 100 pharmacists in Croatia. And those dots that you can see were the levels of the competences at the beginning of the project. So we were measuring how well they are performing in the certain aspects. Then we provided one year education with many projects, with many activities, with many mentors uh, around those uh, pharmacists. And look what happened. The competences has been growing and it's very visible. It was statistically different, which means that we should publish it as a scientific publication. And this was the result of learning. So basically what, how we can use the competency framework is to measure competences where they are, provide the proper education and then measure it again. Look at the areas that we have been developing at that time, counseling the patients, monitoring drug therapy, medicines information, patient education and monitoring of treatment outcomes. What was the best part that we have developed the most in those competences that we were the lowest at the beginning. And this publication, you can also uh, take a look at. Uh, Andrea is one of my co-authors here, and I'm sure that you would enjoy to see how we have developed through the education in the workforce development. Next one, please. One is also very important one, connected with another framework, which actually designs educational activity Based on a based on the competency level at the beginning and addresses science, practice, and ethics in any educational activity. What does it mean? If we put the good presentation, like for example, this one today, we need to have some science elements there to build what? The knowledge aspect of our competency. Then we need to have some examples, maybe some case studies, maybe someone from practice to build what? Skills. And then we need some ethical questions to be asked and answered, maybe even discussed, maybe even debate. And then to make some conclusions to build our attitudes and values. Therefore, in every proper quality education, either is it in academia or in continuing education, we should build on those three foundations. If you want to know more, there is also a link to the publications, which are one from FIP, um, connected with uh, uh, academic programs, educational programs, and one for CPD or CE, connected with your everyday practice in uh, community pharmacists. Next one, please. 
So yeah, once more, just to emphasize that all those three are, are compiled to the, to the competency area. And uh, thank you very much, we can go further. Uh, here, uh, just to uh, let you know that um, uh, the, the new levels, the new advanced levels of the competencies are described in the Global Advanced Competency Framework, right, which I already mentioned before. And you can see the six important areas that all pharmacists in the world should be more developed. Uh, and maybe specifically in the certain ones which have which are of the area of their interest. So expert professional practice can be more in clinical um, uh, way. So either you want to be more expert in anti-microbial uh, stewardship, or maybe mothers and babies care, or maybe um, I don't know um, uh, cancer care, something like that. Then uh, next one is a collaborative working relationship. So this is also a competency, how to recognize your peers, how to connect with them, how to collaborate. Leadership, one of the most desired skills that we all need in the pharmacy world and in the world in general, because we need to lead some changes in the healthcare profession. Then a management of our time, priorities, people, human resources, projects, and things like that education, training, and development. And from this one, we will soon see a new framework produced by uh, working groups in FIP, which will be for educators development, for people like us who want to educate in the pharmacy field. Uh, this one should come uh, in a few Ariana, we cannot hear you. Sorry to interrupt. Ariana? Marvan, can you hear Ariana? I can't hear Ariana. I think she's frozen. Yes, just oh now she disappeared. Oh. She is not anymore with us. Probably she will be coming back in a while. Okay. Would you like me to continue on to the next section? Uh, how many slides more does she have? Um I'm not too sure. Dear attendees, we apologize. We are making we are trying to make sure that Ariana will be back as soon as possible. Just one, one slide left. I think that was the basically the last one, yes. She still didn't join us. Uh, maybe we can move forward and we will come back to her when she is with us. Yeah, sounds good. Excellent. So um, thank you, Ariana, and hopefully you do come back to us and we can hear the final bit of your presentation. Um, but for now, in the interest of time, we might need to um, move on. So we will move now on to the practice element, and we're actually have a really special event this evening in that we're going to be launching the Humanitarian Pharmacist Framework. Um, so to do this, we have two very special speakers. So first up, we have um, Sylvain, and Sylvain is currently the director of the Plasma Protein and Related Products Program at Canadian Blood Services. He served 28 years in the Canadian Armed Forces, holding various roles and positions as a military pharmacist and retiring as the national practice leader of um, National Practice Leader for Pharmacy, responsible for the management of the Canadian Armed Forces Drug Program. He's also an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Medicine um, of the Ottawa University. Um, and we also have Andrea. Um, so Andrea is a senior expert strategist, project manager, learning specialist and researcher. She's an experienced in developing global innovation frameworks, programs, policies and strategies for governments and non-government organizations such as the World Health Organization and UNESCO. 
An expert in global health workforce, she led the strategy and implementation of pharmaceutical workforce and education learning programs and policies for organization members of FIP. Her tools are being used by healthcare professionals worldwide. Thank you so much. I will hand over to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Libby. And I'll just present this slide and then um, uh, to, uh, leave to Sylvain to present his part and then come back to present um, one very special event. Um, this part is about the practice element of uh, DG number five. We all know uh, from previous, as Marwan was mentioning, um, that it contains three aspects. Um, very eloquently, Ariana has described the workforce and education part, and we are going to uh, present to you the practice element. What we've done with the practice element in this case is really about using uh, competency-based frameworks to support the development of practitioners, especially in a specific professional services within their scope of practice. And in that case, we have done one um, very unique framework and probably one of the first um, from healthcare professional aspect on humanitarian arena. And this is what we're uh, going to present to you. So this aspect or this practice element, it defines essential and advanced services delivered by pharmacists or pharmaceutical workforce um, within their scope of practice, defining um, list of competencies that need to uh, deliver those services, but also to ensure that these developmental frameworks support the leadership, humanistic and ethics development of the workforce itself. So supporting this development and training of service-led competencies through um, certification, continuing professional development opportunities. So in a nutshell, this is what the mechanisms we've also have used and employed with this very unique framework, which Sylvain would take us through um, how this came about to do. The floor is yours, Sylvain. Thank you very much, Andrea, and uh, thank you, DB, for the introduction as well. So this is the typical disclosure slide. There's no disclosure that I have, but I think the important point here is uh, in the presentation, you will see the logos of several organizations and associations. I do not endorse or advertise for any of those organizations, but they are there because the members of the working group uh, either work for those organizations or have worked in those organizations, so it needs to be recognized. On the next slide, you'll see uh, if we look today, actually this, uh, th this slide was taken last week. These are all the active disasters that are being tracked right now uh, around the world. Uh, so we can see that disasters are something that is that are current. It's not something that happened once and we don't see them again. And on a week to week basis, I keep monitoring that website and it keeps changing. and It's very dynamic. On the next slide, you'll see uh, a little bit more of the uh, what we can see. So one more click, Libby, please. So whether we're talking about floods, landslide, hurricanes, uh, if we're talking about forest fires that could be uh, caused by storms, uh, earthquakes, all of this has a, a huge toll, whether it's a financial toll or a human toll, and this keeps increasing year over year over year. Uh, next slide, please. So the Canadian Armed Forces have the Disaster Assistance Response Team, which is an organization or a group of people that is deployed in other countries when there are disasters. Uh, in this case, in the Philippines 2013, the DART was deployed. There's about two, 200 people that go there and out of it, about 50 are healthcare providers. The other ones are mainly engineers to rebuild bridges and, and schools and things like that. Uh, so the healthcare providers going there, they will deploy it and, and the first picture where you see the grass there does represent normally the type of environment that they will see. So they will set up a kind of a field hospital there. And the next picture shows what the pharmacy looks like in that environment. So uh, this is what a typical pharmacy would look like. And I see typical because you can see that by saying typical, it's really atypical on what the pharmacy looks like. Uh, we work from panniers, which are the uh, boxes in the middle, often under a tent, no air conditioning, no other type of protection. So the pharmacists really need to be able to be adaptable uh, to work in that kind of environment. And the next picture will show us how adaptable actually pharmacists need to be. 
So this picture, you can see uh, the gentleman on the left-hand side that is more standing is the pharmacist that normally holds all the equipment, the medication for the dart uh, before the dart is deployed. And that box there is actually the, uh, the, the box of controlled substances that needed to be transferred to the pharmacist that is currently signing it. So this is a typical activity pharmacists would be doing, handing over custody of controlled substances. What's unique in this position, in this picture is that was taking part at the airport moments before the pharmacist was leaving uh, to go to the Philippines. So again, you really have to be adaptable to the situation. On the next slide, we will see that my background is on the military, so I have more examples there, but this is not unique to the military. We have other organizations around the world that do fantastic work in terms of humanitarian, whether it's uh, responding to a disaster or other humanitarian work. Uh, we have refugee camps, uh, which is basically a new city, a small city being built that had their own uh, issues with healthcare, public health, and, and there are pharmacies that are supporting those refugee camps as well. And we can see sometimes the warehouses, how they are, uh, all, all the medication maybe just in, in re regular cardboard boxes and, and, and that type of equipment that is not something that we're necessarily used to see in a, a typical community pharmacy. Next slide, please. So where did the need come from? I've been involved with the FIP for about 20 years now. Most of it was with the military and emergency pharmacy section. Uh, I've, I've been with the uh, EXCO or in various positions uh, with uh, MEPS for probably at least a decade, maybe more. And uh, when I've been involved with the FIP, I've, I've you know, because I used to wear my uniform at the conferences, I, uh, I often went to the YPG meetings, I would often get pharmacists approach me and ask me, how can we get involved if we want to do humanitarian work? What's the best training we can get? And, and I was always challenged to be able to answer that because I know that there are many programs around the world that exist uh, for training pharmacists. Some of the programs may be just a, a week program, a week crash course that exists. There are university providing uh, uh, elective that patient, pharmacists can take and other programs that are like a certificate uh, program. Uh, so there's no consistency on, on what is provided. And it's very hard for me to know what's good, what's not good. And in parallel to this, uh, there were some organization, uh, I would say about five years ago, approached FIP and said, well, we are looking for pharmacists that have some experience, training, knowledge in that field, uh, but we don't know what courses are, are reliable. So is there anything FIP can do? Because those organizations will provide training for their own pharmacists, but there is no necessarily recognized training. So there was a, really a need for FIP to get involved and come up with a competency framework that can be recognized internationally so that those programs that exist can be looking at those competencies, uh, that competency framework and making sure that what they are teaching meet the need of the organization. And then pharmacists now would finally have a source of programs where they could go and achieve those uh, learning objectives they're trying to do. Next slide, please. So the working, working group was uh, established in 2017. Uh, you can see from the organizations there uh, who uh, the people, like the experience that pharma, the, the, the pharmacists had as one point of interest as well is those organizations have not endorsed the competency framework either. The people did not go there representing those organizations. They came to the working group with their own experience that came from working with those organizations. So over the last four years, uh, we did several uh, things. We started with the literature search, looking at what is available in the literature, and by far most of what's available there is related to disaster. Uh, then we supplemented that with the expertise of the people around in that group, and we expanded that beyond just responses to disaster or emergency response, but also to look at development, developmental work uh, in the humanitarian uh, arena as well. And then we had also part of the working group, uh, people working in academia, uh, and we had uh, Andrea and Naoko that join us as well to convert what we were able to capture because the people of the working group, uh, except for Andrea and Nalco, don't, we don't have expertise 
in the com development of competency framework or competencies. So what we did is we listed activities or tasks, and some of it might have been competencies as well, of what pharmacists or the pharmacy workforce would be doing in that kind of environment. Next slide, please. So that work led us to bring almost 600 activities, uh, and they were divided whether they were related to pharmacologistics, uh, meaning anything that has to do with the movement of, of the medicine, the cold chain, all of this. And then the other activities, almost 350 activities, which were more like typical activities based on the professional uh, uh, judgment of the pharmacists or their competencies as well, expanding to public health and other type of training that in time of uh, humanitarian uh, work, you need to be involved as well. Those were then uh, narrowed down to uh, specific key activities and then certain domains. And all of this then uh, working with Andrea and Nelco was converted in competencies. And that I believe is my last slide and we'll bring it to Andrea on how this became the competency framework. Back to you, Andrea. Thank you so much, Sylvain. And now, you can click on the next um, um it's the official launch i am officially launching the fip global humanitarian competency framework version one this is just a snapshot of the um, overview of what the framework looks like as you can see a lot of work has uh, been added into this and thank you marwan um for uh, just uh, providing the the link to all of you participants at the moment. It is now, this is the moment we've been waiting for a lot of time, a lot of years, as Sylvan was mentioning, that has combined into the humanitarian competency framework. Next slide, please. And how was this then um, developed? Building on the FIP Global Competency Framework version two that was launched last year, 2020, also recommend you to have a look at it um, as well, which has uh, global validity was key for this project that ensuring that the adopt and adapt approach for implementation can be consistent and can be applied globally as well as regional and at national levels. We have all of this work done before uh, with the GBCF and currently a version two, and we've used that as a basis, as a guide for all of what was happening now in the humanitarian for pharmacists and pharmaceutical workforce. So in a nutshell, what looks like um, from all of those 600 lists um, of activities that we had as a base, We've clustered them, we've analyzed them, and we've turned them into competencies, connecting those attitude behaviors into something that um, is more developmental and useful for pharmacists and pharmacy workforce or pharmaceutical workforce working in the humanitarian arena. They still have the four main clusters similar to the GBCF, so pharmaceutical public health, pharmaceutical care, organization and management, and also the professional and personal aspect. All of this has different focuses, uh, population, patient systems and practice, and different knowledges um, attached to those groups, uh, more scientific or more management. And management also was a very um, clear aspect of this speciality of this area um, and, uh, of work. So in total, and I'm also a numbers person, it's really looking at, it has four clusters, 22 competencies, 85 behaviors, and 228 indicators. It's by no means a short framework. It also doesn't mean that you have to have all of it or you have to pursue all of it, but we try to make it as complete as possible to make sure that um, who, uses it can identify their learning gaps and also um, ensure that they can um, progress on their performance. So FIP aim to ensure that this is a cross reference to education and training tools and mechanisms that spans sector, sectors and particular uh, specializations. This ensures that validity and credibility are embedded already in this framework. Who can use it? It can be used by all. 
And we mean practitioners, mentors, employees to identify learning gaps and development needs, but also to monitor and or assess performance combined with other developmental tools um, and portfolio aspects of the framework. So educators, as Sylvain mentioned, also can use this as a guide for development training uh, provision. So in a sense, everyone can use it. It can be used as a mapping tool to support pharmacists and pharmaceutical workforce working in these critical important roles. And we did try to make sure that these were broad and flexible and can be adapted um, and adopted by the different um, areas of um, expertise and even looking at national, global uh, and regional levels. Next slide, please. And what does it look like? So I truly encourage you to click on the link and see the document um, itself. The document has a little bit of everything in terms of the background, as Sylvain just mentioned. It has the working group. This has been truly a collaboration within FIP across all of our groups, across especially MEPS, um, but also education. So you can see that we had a very broad and expert group uh, working on this. Encourage you to have a look at it and have a look also in their background to know what has been done before. So this is truly just a snapshot of what is looking at um, on cluster one, for example, in the pharmaceutical public health. And this is um, an enhanced version of the GBCF. What do we mean by enhanced is because it has competencies and behaviors and also indicators to make sure that it's easier um, to be applicable and has increased its usability aspect of the framework itself. Again, uh, very flexible and adapted. Uh, I think roughly the 228 uh, indicators is our broad and aspect that have a lot of um, work that has been done in the background. And we've tried to make sure that everything was included. Um, so I'm going to just end this part of the presentation and the launch of uh, the framework again, saying thank you to the working group and thank you for all of the work that has been done before. Um, I'll check the Q&A to see if you have any questions specifically on, on the development of the framework or the use of the framework. Um, and I would like to, to just state that I thank you for the invite of launching the framework and I'm honored um, that I was able to work in this special project. Thank you. And uh, back to you, I think, Marwan, for the next steps, or Libby. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrea. That was amazing. And I don't know about everyone else, but I had the biggest smile on my face when you said the words officially launched. It's really exciting to see it out in the world after um, it being started in 2017, like Sylvain mentioned. Um, thank you so much for that. And I do think there are a few questions popping up in the Q&A, which Andrea will um, either go in and answer right now, or um, we might save some of them for the panelists, depending on how much time she has. Thank you so much. Um, now, our next speaker is uh, Naoko, who is an assistant professor in international pharmacy at the University of Nottingham, and she's going to be presenting on the science element of goal number five. Um, She's a registered pharmacist in Japan and her research area is pharmacy education and workforce development, competency-based education and training, international education system development, health policy and system research and pharmacy practice. Um, she's sec secretary of the academic pharmacy section of the FIP and a global lead for competency development of the workforce development hub. Now, unfortunately, um, she isn't able to join us today, so, but we... Um, um, do have a pre-recorded video which I will now click through to um, and we will listen to together provided there's no technology glitches. Hi thank you for joining the event today and apologies for my absence. And due to my teaching commitment at the university today. I am Dr. Naoko Rakawa, assistant professor in international pharmacy at the University of Nottingham, UK. 
and one of the global leads for the competency development in the FIP Workforce Development Hub and Secretary of Academic Pharmacy Section of the FIP. Today, I will present the science element of the Development Goal 5 Competency Development. So the mechanisms to achieve DG5 is to define evidence-based competency frameworks for pharmaceutical scientists to effectively meet the needs in academia, industry, and regulatory bodies. But today, I would like to present the overall science aspect of the competency development and how it can support development of competencies for pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists to cover this science element. So competency development associated with many different scientific aspects, including health system research to look at the workforce development plan to effectively sustain the system or improve the system. And the pharmacy practice research is to investigate the relevance of workforce development and education to practice and to generate the evidence for effective workforce development and education. And then the educational research to investigate the current education practice and scientifically supports the advancement of education and workforce development. Then psychology to support the learners and educators in the process of their education and workforce development. Therefore, in order to effectively support advancement in the competence development, then scientific aspect of it is essential part of the journey. Now, I would like to show some of the competence-based education model a little bit more detail. So performance and outcome-based concept of the competence-based education and learning was derived from industrial theory, which was eventually recognized and applied to the education and learning around the 1960s. It was eventually well used in the vocational education, then leads to healthcare professional education, more focusing on holistic views of competencies required for their health professional practice, covering knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values as competencies. These diagrams on the slide were shown in a paper written by the Licensed Commission Group, published in 2010, showing the clear differences you know, between the traditional model and the competence-based educational model. Traditional model, which is showing the upper part of the slide, is showing that the how develop the curriculum in that model. So the, the in the traditional model actually the curriculum was the start point in the, in the model developed you know, by the or the used the resources and, and the expertise and available in the is, institution. This curriculum defines the educational objectives and assessments to evaluate if students have learned what they were taught. On the other hand, the, the CBE model, the, the compared to the traditional model, it has to start from the needs assessment of the national and the local health and demands of health system. Then it leads to identifying the competencies that pharmacists require to serve their local population and communities, then develop the curriculum to prepare learners to obtain the competencies. The important part is that the assessment is not directly connected to the curriculum. So the assessment in the CBE model is to evaluate if students master specific competencies, which they learn in the program, regardless, regardless of time, place, and their paces in the idea. Therefore, competency-based education CBE is sought to be a constructivist in the educational philosophy, requiring that the educators actually personalize the learning opportunities for the learners in order to meet the needs of a group of diverse learners in there. So what we the FIP is here in the FIP needs-based education model, which has been advocated since 2008 
which actually covers the CBE model in it. The FYP needs-based education model suggests that you know, pharmaceutical education should be locally determined, and socially accountable, and globally connected and quality assured to meet the given health needs of the communities. So this cyclic model actually starts you know, from identifying needs, which is the same as the competence-based education, then locally determine the pharmaceutical services required to meet the needs identified, then identify competencies in the pharmacies required to deliver the services, and then develop the education to prepare learners to achieve their competencies. FIP needs-based education model was first developed by the Global Pharmacy Education Task Force convened by the FIP in partnership with the UNESCO and the WHO, then it called for an action since 2008. Since then, FIP devotes an evidence-based development in the local and national competency framework based on the FIP Global Competency Framework and the Global Advanced Development Framework. These are um, aimed at the pharmacists in, in the all sectors, which includes the pharmacists working in academia as in science as, as a pharmaceutical scientist too. And today I'm very happy to um, in, participate in, in the event to launch another competency framework for humanitarian pharmacy too. So if I be continuous in our endeavor supporting the competency developments based on the evidence and in the scientific approach. If I be has the experience in supporting the developments of local and national competency frameworks based on the previous global competency frameworks, but we realized that many challenges in the main to actually implementing the CBE in the initial education. Having considered some important features in of personalizing the process of mastery of competencies, it has been very difficult for initial pharmacy education to adopt all key features in the CBE in such regulatory bounded initial education in many countries and institutions. Therefore, now FIP education is working on the development of a handbook to support implementing the CBE model into the initial pharmacy education. Obviously, we want to go through the scientific process of the development by systematic review of the current CBE models in pharmacy education. And then now we are planning to carry out a global survey to investigate in how CBE model was implemented in across nations as the, the these enables and the change challenges to identify uh, what support and exactly needs in the, in the handbook too. So if you're working in higher education institutions, probably you will be contacted to the pride survey. Please, please take part in the survey to contribute to the development of the handbook. The handbook will be a significant tool to support and advance pharmaceutical education globally through the FIP program. So hopefully you will join that, that development of the uh, handbook too. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event today. Bye. Hi, thank you for joining the event today and apologies. Thank you for all our speakers. I am so happy that during our session, we have covered all the elements of the competency development goal, but at the same time, we have launched our uh, global humanitarian pharmacist competency framework. So uh, we are really so excited about this launch today. Would like to thank all those who worked on it. I'm so happy that Libby and myself were also part of this group led by Sylvain and other colleagues that have really uh, well, that are really well experienced in humanitarian uh, uh, settings. And thank you, Andrea and uh, Naoko for leading the development of these competencies. So uh, we'll go now to the uh, panel discussion. 
uh, we would uh, like to ask all of our speakers to uh, uh, to answer the questions uh, whenever we had it. Um, the first uh, question from my side uh, would be addressed to Andrea. Andrea, now after the uh, presentation, uh, we know that competencies, competency frameworks can fit everywhere, but we have a misconception of uh, having competency frameworks are only important in undergraduate education. However, as we see, we have development of competency framework in different areas and specialties. May you please comment, comment on this and like give us a clear uh, statement about how, where, and why we should be using competency frameworks. I'm not sure about a clear statement, Marwan, um, but absolutely. And I've replied uh, to one of the queries. Um, so in a sense, competency frameworks are uh, for everyone and it's especially for workforce development. And what, what, what we mean by workforce, at the university, you only have so much and you can only learn so much in the five or six or four years that you have as a pharmacist or you know, as a pharmacy uh, support in a sense. The frameworks are meant to be developmental, are meant to support and help identifying our learning needs as well and the needs of the areas and settings that we are working. Most of the competency frameworks that have been developed by FIP has been used outside of academia, especially outside of academia. And we have several examples on how to use this. If we look at, um, I know it's a bit outdated because it was back in 2016, but if we look at the report uh, transforming our workforce, there are examples there that have been used across countries, across regions, um, and of course at local levels. So in a sense, we have developed competency frameworks and they are in use, for example, in specializations in Portugal. Uh, in UK, you have the advance and also the foundation uh, framework that have been used by the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in Portugal by the uh, Portuguese Pharmaceutical Society. In Ireland, I think Ireland is one of also the best examples of the use of the global competency framework version one um, originally. And they've used it across their board. They've looked at identifying what was the need of their pharmacists and not only looked at forward to developing um, continuing professional programs identified as learning gaps of their pharmacists, but also going back into looking at what the pharmacist should look like at the point of entry um, at the foundation. So they're all connected. Uh, it's really part of a developmental aspect, and I can't emphasize this um, enough. I think healthcare professionals, and especially pharmacists, we need to be constantly um, learning new methods, new uh, medications, new forms, uh, and especially now that digital has become quite important, as well as new devices uh, and across all of the devices. It's still important to know um, what we can do, how to do it, what's best um, to continue to learn and to identify those learning needs. And if you look at the frameworks, we don't say that a pharmacist needs all of that because they might not be working across all of those areas. So we're not saying that, especially in the humanitarian um, arena, we're not saying that all pharmacists need to excel in all 228 indicators, but it's a start. It's looking at it as a mapping tool to identify the needs, the learning gaps, and to excel even further, to be able to be the best pharmacist we can be. Does that help? Great, thank you, it helps a lot. Thank you. Libby, any question from your side or I can? So I will give back the floor to Ariana if she wants to uh, like wrap up maybe the <laughs> last slide where we lost her. We know that uh, weather won't help a lot the connection. Welcome back, Ariana. You have directly joined after uh, 
uh, we started the practice element. But if you want to give us a wrap up about your uh, last slide and um, a question for you, you have mentioned the educators framework. So when we say educators, may you please just explain to us what do we mean? So we have had a discussion about that at FIT and would like to know are educators only those that are in a university setting or we do have other educators? <laughs> we definitely do. I need to apologize to everyone because of the storm. Uh, it was a loss of electricity for a few minutes. Therefore, I disappeared from the screen and all the things in my house were shut down. So um, for my last slide, basically, it was my last message um, uh, from my part that from the advanced level framework, we are going to uh, probably derive new frameworks in the different areas of expertise or management or leadership or education and training and the educators train uh, framework is coming also from the this level from the advanced level of of competences for pharmacists so yes and thank you for the question marwan we will capture here all the educators in pharmacy profession meaning academicians from junior staff to the uh, professors who are really experienced and uh, really influential even internationally to the people who are engaged in national organizations or in private uh, CE providing uh, organizations or in the pharmacy chains or in the hospitals as a local educators to others. As well, this is helping for preceptors, for mentors who are educating students and, uh, and young practitioners. So we will all look at the same mirror and take a look how are we dealing with uh, different aspects of teaching, uh, being connecting with, with practice, being connected with science, uh, publishing, researching, uh, digitizing the, edu the education, also connecting with other people. I mean, imagine that all of us have never met before. I mean, some of those documents would never show up on the screen today. So how important really is to be involved in the, in the global initiatives such as FIP is driving for so many years now? How important it is to really try to connect education practice and regulation in our teaching? Because we need to be aware that teaching in pharmacy today, especially, it's, it, 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 it compiles so much responsibility. I mean, I remember my first lectures when I was really a young educator, and I was noticing that students and practitioners and even some international experts are writing down the things that I'm saying. And I thought, my goodness, those people are writing things down. I better be careful what I'm teaching and how I'm teaching and where my sources are. So I think anyone who is interested in teaching in pharmacy, either is it academia level or uh, continuing education level or just a local educator in the, in the maybe a pharmacy chain or, or hospital, should take a look at those pages. Uh, and as Andrea already nicely explained, this is both uh, evaluation, but even more development tools. So this is those are the indicators, the navigators, where we should go, how we should go there. Uh, and hopefully all of those frameworks will have their own uh, special parts with the areas how to improve, how to be better, what tools to use really to develop certain competences. And my last thought, that was on my last slide that I couldn't explain. It's a, two people, two white people, and uh, one is pushing the other to go up. Basically, um, I think there is no competency development without engagement. Uh, none of us have been born as a competent pharmacist and no one will die as a fully competent pharmacist. So we are all in the development process, as Andrea nicely said. So I think we need to mentor each other. We need to share the knowledge and experience and we need to let other people grow and develop next to us. And all these kind of elements we are basically introducing in our frameworks. So I hope everyone will enjoy the humanitarian one because the, today is the day to celebrate this special one. Uh, and uh, as many people already said in the chat box, it couldn't be more timely. I mean, being engaged in humanitarian work, uh, standing up from our comfort zones and go on the places where people are needing us, 
I think it's especially important. And I'm hoping that everyone will read also between those lines. There are many lines. We have seen 230 something lines. But between the lines, there is a call to be a pharmacist of today. So I hope that you guys will enjoy, that you will make your own personal plans, how to develop and finally to achieve them. Thank you. Thank you, Ariana, for, for your answer. And um, I think that every time we, we mention the numbers that we had in this framework, I feel what Andrea felt at the beginning when we had our meeting with her, with all the activities we had that Silva gathered from all the, uh, the team. So my question now is for Silva. Silva, that we have this framework that is out. We're, we're celebrating the, this framework today, but what's next? What is your advice for everyone that is here or that will be watching again our webinar or that will be using the website in order to have a look at the framework? What is your advice for the people What's next? What FIP will be do, will be doing next? So, please. So it, it's a very yeah. Thank you, Marwan. It's a very important question. Uh, I don't know if I know the full answer to it, but the one thing I know is I don't want that framework to be a document on the website that dies there. Uh, we've made so much work. We've had so much work to come to this uh, that I hope that the next steps will be to find ways that that competency framework, which is a foundation document, can then be used in real practice. Uh, we've, we've heard, and it's not my expertise here, but we've heard you know, from Andrea, from Adriana, uh, uh, Ariana, that you know, those competencies can be used for various programs. Either they are building the programs now, and as Andrea said, it doesn't mean that the program needs to meet all the competencies, uh, but they could focus on some areas of, uh, of the competencies, and there could be extensive programs as well. There's nothing to prevent a university to go and potentially do a master's degree in humanitarian world or whatever is required, and then do meet all the competencies for that competency framework. But for other pharmacists that uh, for example, may be interested in working in the envir humanitarian environment, going through a competency framework, they could see which competencies they need to get more knowledge about and then see how they can get that training and learn from it. Because in, in, in today's environment with the technology that exists with Google, and I'm not vouching for Google, but for, for all the, the web uh, documents and of course the libraries, it is relatively easy to learn. You just have to identify what you need to know, and there's going to be a book on that. There's going to be an article on that, and then you can start your own learning. So the competency framework for me, I believe, is just the start of more that can be coming. And I hope that FIP, with the expertise it has through FIPED, uh, the hub, MEPS in terms of expertise, can look at, okay, what would be the next steps? so that that competency doesn't just stay on the shelf, but gets used in practice. Thank you, Sylvain, for this, this question, for the, the answer. Uh, Libby, do you have any questions from your side that we are receiving from the chat box or the Q&A? Uh, No, I can't see um, any new ones popping up in the chat that haven't already been answered. Um, if anyone did have any and you're a fast typer, feel free to pop one in there. So maybe we will, my last question would be a fill in the blank for the three speakers. So Ariana said competency frameworks are hard to develop. I would add but and we'll let you fill in the blanks. So competency framework are hard to develop, but we will start with Ariana. Have I ever said that they are hard to develop? Yeah, it's not easy to have a competency framework, <laughs> framework out. This is, a, it's, not <laughs> hard, it's not easy to have it out, but it is what? Look, no matter how much time, no matter how much effort, no matter how much starting from the beginning and turning our point to the different side and then starting all over again, it's so worth it. Because um, I'm, sometimes I'm, I'm, I have two associations connected with the framework. One is 
For example, you know this beautiful feeling when you want to, to travel and when you want to buy yourself an air ticket. And then you go to the page of the air company and they don't ask you first, where do you want to go? The first question is where you are at the moment. So what is your starting destination? And then they ask you, where do you want to go? And then you click and you see your options. So basically the competency framework is like this. I mean, where am I at the moment? Let me take a look at the mirror and see how am I doing right now? And then what is my desired destination? As Andrea says, in which areas exactly I need to develop? I actually, I have to, because I, mean, I was in America for the vaccination training and some people were asked, why are you here today? They say, my employer said he will fire me if I don't get it. So this is the demand. So what do you want to do? And then you click and then there are many possible ways to reach the destination from where you are. So the framework will show you where you are, where do you want to be or where it's possible to be, and then hopefully also how to go there. And another association is like a health check. It is a little bit scary to take a look at all the parameters that you need to check. I mean, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your weight, everything, your bones, your, your, your blood. But once you see it, at least you know what to fix and how to fix it. And it's a great feeling once you... Uh, once you uh, uh, decide to do that, then it's very, very possible. Thank you, Ariana. We'll go to Sintram. So, the humanitarian framework was lengthy to develop, but... Doesn't seem to... Un You're on mute. Yeah. It doesn't want to uh, unmute. Okay, let's go to Andrea and the Silicon Texas audio. Andrea? Sure, but through collaboration, everything is possible. Um, taking some time, um, maybe some um, personal developments in the middle, um, growing uh, tiny humans as we speak, and uh, it's done. It's, 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 so, it's harder if um, when we start as with nothing. Uh, with a blank page. We didn't start with a blank page. We started with activities in a working group that had done so much before um, that it was truly an honor to pick that up and, and change it and transform it. So it is hard, but through collaboration across FIP in this sense, everything is possible. So true, thank you, thank you. Sylvain? I still can't. Uh... It's working. No, no, it's uh, the mute doesn't come out. So you're unmuted. Oh, I, can, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Yeah. Okay, that's fine <clears throat> because like my my screen totally shut down, so I don't know what's happening. Uh, yeah. So so the but would be like, but if you're patient, if you're dedicated the result and the reward is worth it. Uh, and I mentioned it a bit earlier in the question that, that you had for me. I don't see the launch of the competency framework as the outcome, as the end. That's really the foundation that the start. So what we did was the background work. Now we're really into uh, reaping the reward from it, having more pharmacists being trained and available for humanitarian work uh, will be really the big reward. So definitely uh, it's, it's being patient, getting there and, and tapping into the expertise of, of everyone. Andrea mentioned it here about the collaboration. There's no way that me personally, the rest of the working group would have been able to develop a competency framework. We had no expertise in that. There's no way that me alone would have been able to come up with all those activities. My area of expertise is focused in one area, while the area of expertise of others were focused in other areas. So through collaboration, through the FIP network, we can then have something and the reward is very, very, very good. Thank you, thank you. Just to announce that over social media, we have a lot of great feedback. So uh, things are being there, everyone is happy. So we're not only live here, but social media is also working, LinkedIn and other FIP social media. Thank you, everyone. 
these are our final comments. Libby, may we go to the next slide, please? So now we'll go to the monitoring and evaluation of DG5. We are happy to have uh, with us uh, today, uh, Chris John. Chris is the lead, FIP lead for data and intelligence, and he would like to, uh, to present to you a few slides and to engage you in a small activity. Chris. Thanks, Marwan. Hi, everyone. Please stay tuned. This is the part of the event where we are seeking your involvement, specifically with the monitoring and evalu evaluating of Development Goal 5 via the Global Pharmaceutical Observatory. Next slide, please. Just briefly, the FIP Global Pharmaceutical Observatory's mission centers around data, intelligence, advocacy, and reporting. We know the importance of data and for data to provide us with evidence and for evidence to provide us with intelligence. And this is just as important for Development Goal 5 as it is for all the other development goals. So our first task is to collate valid global data on workforce, education, practice and pharmaceutical science. We must undertake comprehensive analyses of collated data to provide accessible high quality intelligence and all this must be communicated innovatively to promote our member organizations and others impact on health. And this communication will often be via the FIP Atlas which is our visualization platform for the Global Pharmaceutical Observatory for displaying our intelligence across the globe. So we'll be able to show what is happening with development goal five across the globe. Finally, we will provide evidence-based strategic information, reports and guidance on the application of pharmaceutical science, policies, practices and services. Next slide, please. This slide shows you the FIP Global Pharmaceutical Observatory Outputs and influences, uh, these include sharing and disseminating intelligence, uh, country monitoring, reporting and information comparisons. This could be benchmarking for how many pharmacies, prescriptions, regulatory comparisons, vaccinations, service comparisons, competency framework use, whatever it is. Um, other outputs and influences are research and analysis, evaluation of trends to support action planning, facilitating collaborative working and national and transnational working, evidence generation for capacity building, potential linkages with other observatories. And finally, why we're all here today, health systems strengthening by tracking progress against development goals, in this case, development goal five. Next slide, please. Some of the work, and current actions and projects of the GPO, just to show you are We've been undertaking a big project on a multinational education and training needs assessment. One of the key outputs of this project and key message was that some nations are needing more support with developing competency-based approach to education. I've mentioned the Atlas and the work we're doing there. We've also building a GPO microsite and database, and we have a Data and Intelligence Commission advising us on our strategic direction. But the main piece of work we're undertaking, and again, while we're all here today, is developing development goal indicators so we can monitor and evaluate progress against the development goals. Next slide, please. So FIP, and this is where you come in, is now seeking to develop indicators and country level metrics to measure and monitor progress and the performance of the implementation of the FIP development goals via the Global Pharmaceutical Observatory. So we would now like to seek your support for this Global Indicators and Metrics project by contributing to this brief activity that you're seeing on the screen linked to this current FIP digital event on Development Goal 5. We would like you to click on the link you can see on the slide or scan the QR code and this will take you to a very brief activity where we'd be seeking your views and expertise in how we might monitor progress towards Development Goal 5 competency development. You will also receive an email to complete this activity after the event if you don't manage to complete it during the event, but we would really welcome and urge you to undertake the activity now. So that's all I had to say. I'm going to also paste the link into the chat box so you can have a look and Thanks, Marwen. I'm handing back to you.
Thank you, Chris, and would like uh, all our participants to give us just a few minutes in order to scan the code or to click on the uh, link in order to try to have indicators for GG5. We would like also uh, moderators and uh, speakers of this session to, to be part of this activity. Uh, we would go to the next slide, please. So as you said, all well, thank you for attention. And in the next slide, you can see that we have our upcoming uh, webinar of the series, the DG21 uh, goals webinar, which will be taking place on November 10th. Uh, it will be about quality assurance. And please, you can go and register to this webinar on www.fip.org uh, slash events. Uh, uh, Libby, I will uh, go back to you for you to uh, conclude our webinar. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Marwan. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you may be. It's been really lovely to have you all. Um, and just so that we all know, um, just to reiterate that FIP offers various digital events on a wide range of topics, including antimicrobial resistance, non-communicable diseases, vaccination, development goals, patient safety, prevention, and so much more. You can have a look at the events here. Um, thank you again for joining joining us and um, that link should be in the chat now so you should be able to um, go in and complete the FIP development goal five competency mm -hmm. development um, survey that's been popped in there. Um, thank you once more. Anything else to add Marwan before we close? Thank you to all of our panelists of course for taking the time out of their days to join us. So we'd like to thank everyone, uh, our panelists, our participants, and I, we don't know if uh, anyone from the speakers would like to have a final final note. And uh, Andrea, Ariana, or Sivan, or just a bye bye. Just thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, we. Uh want you to uh, use the framework tell us how you're using it it's a starting point as Sylvain was saying this is this was the launch is not the end it's really the beginning and so tell us about your journey reach us and um, thank you thank you for listening thank you and if anyone has questions to uh, Naoko please do not hesitate to send it to us to any one of us here and the as uh, the group and we will be uh, forwarding the question to Naoko about the science element of the competency development. Bye-bye and thank you for now. See you on our next event.